Hello, Priscilla. Uh, let me know if you can hear me okay. Uh, we'll get started here in just a few minutes. Um, but I would like to check audio, so uh, let me know if you have a microphone today, if you'd like to speak and or video. be more than happy to uh, activate those for you. Great. Excellent. All right, I'm going to go ahead and just activate your mic if you just want to test it out. Hello. Excellent. Clear and everything. So um, great. I was glad to be able to catch you. So that's that's very very good. And uh, so we'll see what happens. Great. It's still early. So yeah, it is a little early. What? A while, I guess. What time is it uh, where you're located? Oh, well, hey, it's Eastern Standard. It's, it's, it is nine a.m. Oh, okay. And I was up. I had it seven. I was up anyway. Okay. Okay. Well, thank. How are your studies going? How are your studies going? It, it's going okay. Um, yeah. In fact, that's so I'm, what I'm going to talk a little bit about as far as uh, EduWiki, EduQuickie rather, and that's uh, kind of a project, the research project that I'm involved with will involve uh, EduQuickie. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But it's going okay. I'm going to be starting my research here in uh, probably a month or so. I'm trying to finalize the proposal and trying to get that authorized so so yeah it's it's moving along how have you been okay, well, I'm good I'm at the I finished all of my coursework I'm trying to get my chapters one two and three approved by my committee and then once that is done I will do um, my studies I'm looking at it trying to stay connected with my what is IQ uh, mm -hmm. international students so that I'll have a a working, um, you know, people to do the study. So mine is going to be, right now I'm looking at doing it on with IQ. The study is about with IQ. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with something called the Q method. It's something that's kind of new. Well, not many people. I didn't find, but maybe four, four studies that have used the Q method. Uh -huh. So it's about, it's about subjectivity. So I, uh, so we'll see how that goes. I'll keep you posted when I get approved. Yeah, please do. I'm please do. Sounds sounds interesting. And I'm going to invite, I'm going to invite someone who is trying to understand wikis. I don't know that he's available, but I will send him. Oh, well, actually, he's not even online. Hello, EFL campus. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you have an, if you'd like to include your name there, um, feel free to do so. And also, if you have a microphone, would like to say hello. We're, we'll be getting started here in just a few minutes. Uh, we're just running kind of an audio check, sound check with everyone. So let me know if you do have uh, a mic. Okay, I'll go ahead and activate it. If you'd like to say hello. Hello, is it working? I'm not a whole campus, I'm Elena. <laughs> nice to see you guys, Benjamin. Priscilla, hello, how are you doing? Great, welcome. Amir. Um, it's a long time in, in hearing you. I'd love to hear your voice. We have to chat again, so thank you. It's good to see you on, on, online. I hope everything is going well with you. Yes, thank you. It's quite hectic, but uh, I think things have um, at last started to, you know, to shape up a bit because it was really driving crazy. And how are you doing, Benjamin? I haven't seen you in a long time as well. Priscilla, you have disappeared off Skype. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Sounds like a busy world. For me, what happens is I'm probably always on Skype. But when you have international friends and I love talking with them, they always want to call. So I stay invisible for the most part. And uh, <clears throat> then I can easily select who I want to speak with without, you know, hurting people's feelings by saying, oh, well, I saw you online, but I couldn't talk. So I'm always there. <laughs> so we'll talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah, things have been kind of crazy for me. I haven't actually been back to WizIQ for several months uh, trying to finish up my dissertation trying to get ready ready for the actual research so I've been kind of involved with that 
as of late. So that's my excuse. I don't know if it's a good one, but that's that's um, that's what I've been up to. So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I thank you for, both for for being here. Uh, this is I've titled this Teacher Talk Time, and what uh, my intention here is really to start offering hopefully on a weekly basis uh, a discussion here through WizIQ uh, related to basically educational topics and uh, today I'm going to explain uh, a, a website that I've been working with a lot, EduQuickie and I'm, I, I'm doing some research currently for doctoral uh, studies on uh, personal learning networks and using personal learning networks as a form of uh, personal or professional development or professional learning. So these the teacher talk time sessions that I'm going to conduct in WizIQ kind of go with the work that will be done in EduQuickie and uh, I'll explain some of that here in a few minutes. What I'm going to be doing is kind of jumping back and forth between screen sharing and then coming back and hopefully uh, having a discussion with you all about uh, some things that I'm sharing. So. Um, we are using a Twitter hashtag, and if you are connected with Twitter and wish to use that, I will be checking that. Uh, just, uh, just in case uh, I miss something, I think the last time I did screen share with WizIQ, I'm not sure if we can conduct conversations. I'm not sure if I'll be able to see the chat, so that was my concern. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think I'll be able to access the chat box when I'm screen sharing. So the hashtag that we'll be using... is EduQuickie. I'll go ahead and include that here. Okay. So yeah, we'll, we'll make it work here. So uh, if, if you do want to use uh, the Twitter hashtag, feel free to do so. But if not, we'll, I'll jump back uh, and we can uh, carry on the discussions there. So today we'll talk about EduQuickie and I'll start off by doing that and then I'll talk a little bit about accountability. and. Um, I really, I, I, I titled this accountability um, based on some readings that I've come across this past week and some interesting comments that I've seen, some posts, and so I kind of wanted to talk about those and uh, get, get your opinions. So the idea again with Teacher Talk Time, it's kind of a play on words because as uh, language teachers, there's this issue between how much Teacher Talk Time should be uh, compared to... Uh, student talk time and so the idea usually in the class is we want to reduce teacher talk time and have more student talk time but in this case uh, since this is an open uh, forum the idea is to have as much teacher involvement interaction as possible so that's really the point of these sessions so I hope not to dominate too much of the conversation I have several topics probably we won't have time to get through all of them but again it's just to kind of stimulate conversation so hopefully uh, you'll be um, you know, open to participating and share ideas. So, having said that, we, I will go ahead and start activating the screen share. And if for some reason something uh, doesn't work, uh, if one of you wants to either post it in the Twitter, uh, feel free to do so. If for some reason you're not able to see what uh, what I see. So I've activated the screen share, so hopefully you can see now uh, the wiki, I'm sorry, the EduQuickie website. And uh, this is the website that I've started, uh, I guess about a month ago. I, I've had this wiki space for about three or four years, but only have recently tried to kind of organize it in a way that I think will one, serve my research purposes, and two, I think just be a little bit more user-friendly for any teachers willing or wishing to collaborate and work together. So as any wiki spaces, you're able to join and you can contribute to the wiki, and, and that's the whole point. All the information that is shared in EduQuickie and all the information shared in uh, Teacher Talk Time is under a Creative Commons license. So uh, you're encouraged to share this information uh, with others, reuse it, redistribute it as you wish, as long as you give attribution back to EduQuickie uh, and, and a link back to the, the source. So the information here that, uh, that I have, uh, basically 
uh, I start off by talking about personal learning action network and, and that's really the, the purpose of EduQuickie is to begin thinking in terms of a personal learning action network and I throw in action there as a, as a means of uh, stressing the importance of interaction and sharing diverse ideas um, and diverse opinions. So uh, if I scroll down here, there's different sections, the teacher talk time topics. So for example, uh, next week, this information will be populated to cover different sources that I come across that I'm sharing through Digo that are related to possible topics uh, that will be discussed the following week. So these, uh, these topics here are actually the topics we'll be discussing uh, today. Perhaps not all of them, but uh, these are some of the topics that we'll be covering. Um, this information in Digo, I'll share you the, the link of the list that I've created uh, where you can go and access that link uh, at your, uh, as you wish. And uh, the, again, the idea is as the week progresses, you can see and make comments uh, and share information about the topics or the potential topics that will be discussed during the actual live session. So just below the teacher talk time topics we have the actual teacher talk time feed and this is the feed back to uh, WizIQ. So as you notice here I've already scheduled the, the next session which will be next Thursday uh, and then today's session. So uh, you, you're able to access this, uh, these online sessions directly from the EduQuickie webpage. Now below this I have a section called Open Educational Resources and Open Courseware. Some of the courses that I've been teaching and that I'm teaching currently this semester um, I'm sharing and I'll show you those in just a few minutes but these are quick links back to some of the courses and some of the student projects that uh, that I've been involved with and again this the idea here is to share <clears throat> some of the courseware that I'm doing and because this is a, a wiki you know anyone is, is able to share uh, whatever they're doing as well so uh, this is not just uh, about me sharing what what I'm involved with uh, the teachers uh, and basically any educators who wish to share are encouraged to participate however they wish uh, again through the EduQuickie website if you'd like to share your educational educator blogs, like if you have your own personal blog and would like just to post a link here, feel free to do so. And I've included some just different links of information uh, related uh, to education, as, long, as well as uh, some Twitter chats that I, I think are quite interesting. So I'm trying to keep a, a list, more than anything, to keep it all organized in my mind as far as when these chats are coming. It seems like Every time I want to participate in a Twitter chat, I miss it. I, I forget the, the time or I don't schedule it. And so what I've done is create a list here to help, help me and help others see at a glance when up and coming Twitter chats are, are scheduled. And so, so, that's, so these are some links here that you can, uh, you can have access to. So. Uh, I'm not going to go through the entire site because there's a lot of information here, but I, I do want to draw your attention to uh, this, the right-hand side here where I've got the dailies, which are basically um, aggregators, I guess would be the word, that you can bring in information, uh, in this case related to applied linguistics, uh, see you daily, which is basically just my, my uh, Twitter, the, tw the people that I follow through Twitter, and EduQuickie feeds and EduQuickie feeds is related to this uh, widget and which is a scoop it widget which basically covers topics related to personal learning networks. Now the the research that I'm uh, being involved with that I'm currently involved with is related to this page which I call EduQuickie connection and There'll be some changes. Uh, this is just getting started, um, but basically this will be the, I guess, the home base, if you will, uh, where, where the teachers that will be participating in my study will, will be working. And because this is going to be an open, I guess, an open research, if you will, this, it's very much like a MOOC in the sense that it's, it's going to be an open online, I guess, learning experience. But basically anyone can participate in the activities that the participants of my research will be, will be doing. So 
there won't be too much of a distinction as far as the, re the, the participants of my studies and anyone who wishes to participate uh, as it relates to the work being done in EduQuickie. Obviously, I'll be focusing on the participants as, as far as the data collection process, but again, the idea is that uh, the participants of my study are interacting with not only amongst themselves, but also educators you know, from around the world, potentially. So the idea is to keep as much of this research as open as possible with regard to the activities that they will be doing uh, in EduQuickie, as well as um, yeah, basically any of the, the data collection that, that, have, that transpires throughout the research. So uh, this is uh, the main page. Again, uh, it's still a work in progress. I guess it'll always be a work in progress, but it's um, basically just a starting point uh, to share with you. Uh, and if you are interested, obviously, you're encouraged to, to participate. It does require that you sign in and create an account in Wikispaces and that you join uh, the wiki. Basically, that's what I wanted to share with you. There's a lot of other information. I have one page that's dedicated to Teacher Talk Time where I will be indexing uh, the information in these live sessions. So much like on the, the main page, we have the Teacher Talk Top, sorry, Teacher Talk Time Topics. We have the feed. We also have a calendar and uh, the videos. This will be this will show uh, past uh, videos. And uh, then I'm going to create an index down here, which would just be a, basically a hyperlink based on uh, topics. So as different topics uh, are discussed in the, during the sessions, I will try to index and organize those. So those will be a little bit, uh, it'll be easier to find specific topics that you would like to, to uh, know more about. I'll go ahead and uh, let's see, go back and see if anyone has any particular questions about EduQuickie. Again, this is just a brief overview um, and you're encouraged to visit uh, the site, take a look at it and uh, offer comments, suggestions, any, any ideas you have about how to make it uh, better. So I'll go ahead and pause there and ask if you have any questions about, uh, about the EduQuickie website. You can either activate your mic if you wish or you may just uh, post something in the chat box. Yeah, and that's a good point, Priscilla. I'm glad you mentioned that. There's really no right or wrong way to participate in EduQuickie. And certainly, if you'd like just to create an account and just kind of lurk, uh, that's fine, too. Um, it's, it's really uh, as, as you wish. So, um, yeah, definitely uh, take a look at it. And if, if, if it's something that you want to be involved with or just kind of just monitor from afar, that's, that's fine, too. No, no problem. Okay, um, so no, I don't have a presentation yet. May I join? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that this idea is absolutely fascinating, and you've done such a huge job. I mean, the sheer amount of work involved is overwhelming. I would certainly love to join and try to participate, at least, you know, to the best of my abilities. Time permitting, but I think it's a terrific idea with lots of potential because the way it's structured, it offers opportunity to develop in any way you wish to go. I mean, personal contact, sort of like an online diary or uh, scattered notes, anything really. And uh, oh, in your opinion, then, um, do you predict that it could develop into? A kind of a network of, for um, synchronous contacts, like this um, webinar that we are in now. Or why not? Actually, why not? Sorry, answering my own questions. <laughs> Go back and get. Okay, I'll mute. 
No, yeah, and that's that's something that I'm kind of investigating. You know, my research is based on networks, and uh, the theoretical framework is complexity theory. That's what I'm investigating. Actor network theory, um, connectivism, uh, in a sense. Uh, so it's all about networking, really. And so my my hope is, well, what I'm investigating is trying to see what direction teachers go. And even though I'm creating this space in Wikispaces, EduQuiki, um, that doesn't necessarily mean, too, that the participants of the study have to participate in this space. If they have their own blog, if they have their own wiki, uh, we could use hashtags to, to communicate. So they don't even necessarily have to participate solely in EduQuiki. But if, um, you know, these ideas, the idea basically is to see to what degree participation occurs through both asynchronous communication, through blogs and posts and, and wikis, and synchronous through discussions like teacher talk time or any other face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, you know, meetings. Um, the, the participants of this, of this particular study that I'm involved with uh, involve 25 to 30 uh, teachers in higher education here in, in Aguascalientes, where I'm located. So um, the course is designed to be online, but there is a face-to-face -face component. Um, and, you know, getting started, I'll be meeting <clears throat> with the teachers face-to-face, -face, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to uh, see basically to what degree, you know, what their level of comfort is with regard to technology and, and basically how far into using technology this will re result. I'm assuming that the teachers will be at various degrees of, uh, I guess, comfort levels with regard to technology, so some may use technology more than others. But one of the components that, um, you know, that will, uh, I guess one of the main components of the research or the data collection process will be these online sessions. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see how the, the, the link between the work that they do in EduQuiki links over to these, on, these online discussions. And uh, that's something that I'll be researching and looking at, and, um, and we'll see. We'll see what, see what happens. Uh, thank you for including that link, and thank you for reminding me. I'll go ahead and show everyone now. Uh, these are all the links uh, for this particular talk, and again, we'll, we probably won't get to all of them, but... Um, I would like just to share all of those here, and those of you who are watching this recording, this, these sessions are being recorded both in WizIQ as well as uh, I'm recording it on my own computer, which uh, will be uploaded. So um, this information will be uploaded to YouTube, and uh, probably not the whole session, but excerpts uh, that will be that I think are beneficial, and so. Uh, yeah, I want to go ahead and show you those, all of these uh, different links. Okay, great. Now, I, I think we'll go ahead and get started uh, with the issue of accountability. And I'd like to start off first by showing you a video. And this video, uh, I guess I should start off by asking if anyone's familiar with TED-Ed. Have you heard of TED-Ed? Have you ever used TED-Ed? Or are you currently using TED-Ed? Okay. All right, so I'll, I'm going to go ahead and start off with a short video. I think it's about three minutes, and uh, just as an overview, and then we'll uh, go into an interesting uh, discussion, I think, of what I, I came across uh, this past week. Welcome to the TED-Ed Beta website tour. I'm Logan Smalley. I'm Betterhan Sanar. I'm Jordan Reeves. And I'm Stephanie Lowe. We represent the TED-Ed team. We're going to tell you about how the TED-Ed website is organized. About the lessons that surround each video. How you can customize or flip your own lesson. And how you can measure that lesson's effect on your class or the world. Towards the end of the tour, we'll reveal one more major feature that directly affects every person viewing this video. Let's get started with the home page. On the home page, you'll find original TED-Ed videos. Each is a lesson recorded by an actual educator that's visualized by a professional animator. You can nominate educators and animators in the Get Involved section of the site. The TED-Ed library can be browsed through two different lenses. 
learners can use the series view to browse videos thematically and based on their own curiosity. And teachers can use the browse by subject view to find the perfect short video to show in class or to assign as homework. Every video on TED-Ed is accompanied by a lesson. These lessons don't replace good teaching, but they can be supplementary resources for students and teachers around the world. Let's look at this one, created by a teacher in the US and an animator in the UK. When you arrive on the lesson page, simply click play. The video will continue to play as you navigate the lesson sections that surround it. In the quick quiz section, you'll find multiple choice questions that check for basic comprehension of the video. You get real-time feedback on your answers, and if you get one wrong, you can use the video hint. You'll find open answer questions in the think section, and in the dig deeper section, you'll find additional resources for exploring the topic. You can complete the lessons anonymously, but if you log in, you can track your own learning across the site. Just visit the recent activity feed and you'll find answers you've saved to lessons that you've already started or completed. And now to one of the most powerful features of the TED-Ed website, flipping a lesson. Flipping a featured lesson allows you to edit each of the lesson sections. You can edit the title as it relates to your class. You can use the Let's Begin section to provide instructions or context for the lesson. You can select or deselect any quick quiz question. In the Think section, you can add your own open answer questions. And in the Dig Deeper section, you can use the resources provided or add your own. When you finish flipping a lesson, it'll publish to a new and unique URL. And because the link is unique, it can measure the progress of any learner you share it with. You can use it to measure participation and the accuracy of any individual student's answers. So that's how you flip a featured TED-Ed video, but we've got one more major feature to tell you about. Using the TED-Ed platform, you can flip any video from YouTube. That means you can create a lesson around any TED Talk, any TEDx Talk, but also any of the other thousands of great educational videos on YouTube, including the ones that you yourself could record, upload, and flip. And through flipping these lessons, together we'll create a free and remarkable library of lessons worth sharing. Okay, um, what, do you, what do you think about uh, TED-Ed? What are your initial thoughts about using a TED-Ed in, in the classroom? Go ahead. Okay, uh, would anyone like to answer that question? Very good question, uh, Priscilla. Thank you for asking. Uh, any any takers? Anyone wish to address that question? Um, yeah, uh, well, I, I haven't explored everything really, but Priscilla, it's actually simpler than it sounds. Um, you can use the existing videos, you can use existing materials, you can add your own. Um, I haven't published any flips. I just want you to play around a bit first. Um, and I'm not sure what the options are. Do you, can you can you set it to private? Can you have like? But it seems like a non. It functions like an online LMS that lets you have some control. Um, some. Uh, Mm, you know, you can observe who is logged in, not who, but what have what they've done, and and there's a comment area. So it looks very promising because um, you can share the link and then monitor whatever work is being done um, asynchronously at your convenience. Uh, but I plan to, to, to do a real flip and test it with my private students, especially the IELTS pack, because uh, they will probably benefit a lot, a couple of expansions, that kind of thing. We'll see. Try it. Try it. It's great fun. Great. Uh, anyone else care to add anything to that, uh, to the question or to the answer? Um, we had some few of you come in here, and if you, if anyone 
Would like for me to activate your mic, please indicate in the chat box. Um, yeah, the the word the, the word that they use they flip the, the videos. Uh, I think is I think is important. I think that's it gives a way to teachers to really I guess adapt uh, these videos to their own teaching context. And I think that's one of the points that I'd like to focus on when <clears throat> I read a particular post uh, this this past week. Uh, about a criticism about TED Ed, and so I'd like to share with you that that post, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and activate my screen share, and then I'll I'll come back and we can extend the discussion. So, let's see here. Okay. Okay, so the uh, I came across this post, and uh, they basically their the point of this post was to I guess say that they that there is a problem with TED Ed, and the problem being that uh, they state here that what we define as traditional education as a lesson. So the problem with TED Ed is the problem of what we define in traditional education as a lesson. And they go on to say that uh, TED, in the form it is presented online to the masses, is not about doing, it's about watching, listening, and consuming. You shouldn't confuse an inspiring lecture or pro and provocative ideas with learning. And I found this kind of interesting. Uh, they go on to say uh, that is, it's perfectly fine to watch a video, it's perfectly fine to view a lecture, it's perfectly fine to quiz yourself on what you remember from the video or the lecture. It is perfectly fine to write a brief response about a big question. But let's not call that a lesson. That's just a starting point. So the, the argument here seems to be that, that these types of uh, lessons that, that TED Ed is, is producing, or I'm not even sure I would call it a lesson, maybe an activity, but uh, this particular post seems to, uh, I guess, group or consider uh, this, these activities in TED Ed as a lesson. The point is that uh, this is a bad thing and that, that this will, I guess, persuade teachers to go back to more traditional means of, uh, of teaching. But before I, I guess, voice my opinion, I'll go ahead and jump back to the chat and hear from you all. Do you think that... Uh, TED Ed is a bad thing. Do you think this is taking us back as far as uh, the way in which we teach and learn back to traditional methods of uh, multiple choice questions and uh, sage on the stage type of approach? What, do you, what are your thoughts? Well, I hope I'm not jumping over anybody. Well, I have a problem with uh, this review, actually, Ben, because um, uh, I would like to problematize the definition of a lesson. What is a lesson? What is traditional? Traditions are not what they used to be. What is teaching? What is learning? Uh, how do we define the boundaries? And especially in the context of language teaching and learning, where do we stop? How do we define the classroom? Are they learning to pass the test with all the washback involved? Or are they learning because they want to acquire new skill, new perspective, and you know, open doors and windows? I, I find it uh, very uh, disturbing that somebody who is an educator should, uh, you know, uh, fight for um, the definition, or fight over the definition of a lesson. Because of uh, the flips that I've seen and the lessons that I've watched on TED Ed before trying my own, and my own flips, which, which I haven't published yet, uh, they were not conceived, uh, as far as I could tell us, uh, you know, lessons with a rigid uh, lesson structure, with uh, nothing wrong with Bloom, of course, planning outcomes, etc. Uh, it was really fun to see how people experiment with this new platform, with these new formats, to introduce new things, to keep the students entertained, to educate them, and just as an example, uh, one of the flips that I made included uh, snippets from a rather controversial entertaining show, uh, Wife Swap, across different countries. 
I used clips from the USA, the UK, and uh, Canada. That's the only ones that I could find, and it's unfinished work yet. So uh, it was an invitation to the students to view these clips and to discuss differences, uh, cultures, different approaches to conflict resolution, um, the technique that TV um, directors, TV show directors have used to, you know, to get certain points across and whether they're legitimate and all that kind of thing. So, yeah, maybe it's not a lesson, but if it's not a lesson, and yet it works for my students, I'll be happy. Uh, I, I think she's, um, I think that's a, a bit nitpicking and uh, yeah, okay, remove the word lesson. It's a great tool and if we don't use it properly, it's not the tool's fault. Just like the proverbial magic wand, I'm off the soapbox. Great, uh, great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Priscilla, go ahead. changing for teaching, for learning, and what might be called learning today is quite different, looks quite different, feels quite different. Even what we're doing right now, I'm learning, but I don't feel like I'm in my pajamas, and I'm just sitting here and learning. So learning is going to take many different forms. Perhaps the person who wrote the article and written very nicely is perhaps protecting some type of territory, their landscape of what will my next job be? Am I ready to venture out and do something differently? Because with what I know, the little bit I have learned in the past few years about technology, that you know, I didn't go to school to learn anything, and I'm getting into hashtags now, quickly getting information, getting resources that I immediately need. Similar to what you're doing, you're creating an opportunity for educators, specifically educators who want to do more, be more, here is a one-stop shop that you can come to. Not only just come here once, but you can borrow the information that I have and put on your own um, institution, if you will, and there's no problem with that. And I think what happens is that organizations become very possessive about, well, this is my idea, and we take that. But what we've actually done is we haven't taken it. We've just taken one thing, synthesized it, and made it better, and based upon what I see with the TED Ed, uh, it just seems like, you know, with all of this availability, what, there are no limitations. Learning is fun. Learning is interesting. And so I'm just excited about that. And again, I'm saying for the article, well written, but perhaps the focus is, wait a minute, let's protect what we have. And I don't think Yeah, and I think um, I think the issue here too. I agree that the issue, that what is a lesson, and what do we do with lessons, and how do lessons link uh, to other lessons? You know, so there, there's a learning um, trajectory. So there's a learning progression that happens. And when I read this article, I kind of felt the same in that <clears throat> it seems to be f assuming that this activity through TED-Ed, one of these uh, videos is a complete lesson and I think um, you know the issue is what is the lesson and how do we link these lessons. I uh, posted a response uh, in EduQuest uh, about this and voicing uh, my opinion but basically my point was that TED-Ed or any basically any material and I, and I explain in this particular post uh, open educational resources, and to a degree, I consider uh, TED Ed these videos um, as an open educational resource in that people can have access to it and they can modify it as they wish. And so, I, my main point here is really the affordances that 
uh, materials or open educational resources provide. And for me personally, I think TED-Ed provides uh, a good open educational resource that teachers can use and adapt. And I think the original article, um, I didn't focus enough on the adaptability of it. Uh, the video and in the introduction, as we saw, discusses uh, the ability to actually change the questions, change the title, change additional uh, links that are related to that particular topic to, again, uh, relate more to local context. And I, and I think that aspect of TED-Ed was neglected in the, the original post. And I think that makes all the difference. I think that uh, if teachers are able to use this and adapt it, um, you know, that there, there is some potential uh, to for the students to learn. And, and obviously the flipped classroom, as we talked about earlier, if students are doing these types of activities uh, at home, outside of class, then perhaps that frees up uh, more time in class for them to do more dynamic uh, types of activities, which for me is a good thing. So um, yeah, interesting interesting notion there that I wanted to share and uh, get, uh, get your opinions on. Uh, changing topics a little bit here, but still kind of related to uh, accountability and assessment, I came across another article uh, this past week from the Innovator, Innovative Educator, and they, they talked about, I don't know if any of you came across this article, uh, it's titled, uh, The Newest Ed Reform Leader is a 12-Year-Old Opt-Out Hero, and uh, opt-out being that this uh, particular young man uh, basically uh, said he wasn't going to take a standardized test, that he was having problems with um, you know, having tech test anxiety, he was being bullied at school. Uh, I believe he's a diabetic also, so he had some problems controlling his blood sugar, and uh, I think perhaps kids were bullying because uh, of his uh, disease. And this particular article, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, kind of focused, uh, I found it interesting in the way that they focused on uh, the fact that he's a hero because he decided not to take the test. He opted out of taking the test uh, and doesn't talk too much about these issues that I think are, are certainly valid as, as far as being bullied and uh, you know just not being per perhaps not being prepared uh, for the exam. Uh, it, the, the article here mentions the newest heroes of the ed reform movement are the students who opt out and speak out. Their voices are le both loud and proud. They are against tests that they know do not benefit them, and in many cases actually do them harm. And they go on to say uh, that uh, they show an example where the principal actually uh, made some comments to the, the boy's mother, uh, and it mentions here, when Joseph explained he did not want to take the test, his teachers called him a fresh little boy who needs to do what he is told. He also knew his principal wrote an email to his mother explaining that if he didn't follow orders he could be taken away from his mother because he'd call uh, child protective services so when i read this article i thought well there's a lot of issues going on here uh for for them to just decide well he's a hero because he decides to opt out of, of a standardized test and you know standardized testing is a big issue it's a hot debate about uh, whether or not standardized tests are, you know, are relevant or if, if they help actually uh, with the learning process. But I wanted to throw that out about um, what do you think about this uh, as far as the standardized tests, if, what are the implications of young learners opting out of, of these types of tests? Is that a good thing? Is this a trend? Do you think this is productive? Uh, in the dialogue here between actual accountability, test taking, and actual learning. So what do you think? Uh, hello Adam, uh, if you'd like to speak feel free uh, to either make your comments there in the chat room. If you'd like me to activate your mic I certainly will do that. Just uh, let me know through the chat box. change and they have plans. 
or they've got an idea, which I think that you're saying, they're not alluding to what is he choosing to do in lieu of opting out? What is he going to do? Maybe you did say he's doing Ted Ed. Well, then emphasis needs to be put upon that. Okay, he's not taking the standardized test, but he's taking these video lessons, quote, if you will. He's doing the, and he's scoring significantly higher and much more meaningfully by what I understand about Ted, that you move at a pace that is convenient for you if you have a disease or discomfort, and you really can't sit for hours on any other time, but you can spend 15 minutes here and then come back and pick up where you left. That, there's a lot of value in doing something such as this. One of the things I still say is that many people, especially now, are looking to protect their own interests. If students are opting out of taking tests, we can't make them take the test. We're calling different institutions, social services, to report that we've got a chapter about fighting the system. And if everybody is going to just pick up stakes and follow the system and not take the test, then do we really need the teacher? What does that mean for the teachers? We can't get the students to take the test. It's a behavior problem. It's not necessarily a it's a revolution. Things are going to change. So the thing that I see that needs to happen, and you are certainly a big part of what needs to happen, is that we need to find a way to address this before all of the students actually opt out of taking the test. And some of the students will opt out of taking the test, and they're not going to do anything else either, because they don't know that there are other things out there. Um, I think kids, level the playing field to some degree, to some degree, meaning that those students who have the technology resources in their home, cable, and food, because you don't need cable, you don't have food, but you can level the playing fields a little bit, then the students might fare better based upon the kid talk. Again, the students are taking just what they need and nothing more. Because with technology being what it is today, I mean, think we have endless tools to do so much more than just stay in the classroom for 40 minutes here, 45 minutes there, and that like, well, what did I just learn? Okay, anyone else like to share your thoughts? Yeah, um, well, I don't even know where to start. First of all, I have a problem with well, with both sides, really. I sympathize with the boy, you know, even more so. He is my nephew's age, 12 years old. That's a very challenging period. Um, just like him, uh, my poor nephew is going through a horrible period of tests in order to um, be accepted to a posh language school. And lots of children are subjected to this in Bulgaria. Uh, even those who don't opt in for language schools, they have to pass all sorts of tests. This causes a lot of stress. But yeah, they're young, they will survive. My problem is, however, uh, that the younger people are increasingly more illiterate. Uh, they lack basic skills, um, speaking numerous illiteracy, etc., etc., even though the Bulgarian education system is considered to be among the top uh, 10 or 15 in the world, but the results are catastrophic. So what do these tests measure? Yes, we need the convenience because the results are quantifiable, but, but do they really measure something valuable? Uh, because definitely it's not a convenience for teachers and we all suffer from, we and our students, uh, in, even though in different contexts right now for me, but we all suffer from the effects of uh, the washback when at some point you sacrifice uh, the learning in order to prepare them for a test. It doesn't matter if it is IELTS, IELTS or if it is um, Bulgarian language and literature, etc., etc. So the tests have maybe outlived, in this particular form, have outlived uh, their um, useful technological life. But what is to be done is not to be decided at grassroots level, I'm afraid. So if boy, this boy, uh, if, it, if it grows into a uh, discussion among a wider audience and some action is taken to, yes, offer these children an alternative. 
and definitely look into the way these tests are structured and what exactly do they measure and is it useful at all in this day and age. But I'm not an optimist, I'm afraid, Ben. Okay. And, well, we'll see. <laughs> oh, off the microphone. <laughs> Great. Um, Adam, I... Oh, go ahead, Priscilla. I think change is scary. And people, adults, children, everybody, we resist change because we don't know what's behind door number two. We've already gone through door number one and know what's there. We know what the desk are. We know at the beginning of the school year how many students we're supposed to have. And we know the tests that we're supposed to teach. But with all of that we're proceeding with, cell phones, iPads, the technology, but at the rate that things are moving, we realize, we really realize that we need to do something different. I'm a technology teacher by profession, if you will, like to say, but I really don't know, I mean, I know more than I did, but it is not because the school system sent me to workshops and sessions to learn. I learned on my own, and a lot of people I'm making an assumption. A lot of teachers are afraid of technology. Yes, we can do email, but to put a lesson together, I don't know about that. And then to have something, even though it may not be about kids, uh, or, or whatever I'm trying to say, but it's still related, there is that thought that a computer is going to replace the teacher. And what does that mean? I have a job next school year. Will I have something that I can teach? Yeah, the younger teachers per se are digital natives, but do they know how to put a lesson together? No, probably not without some training. So I think that there's a partnership that can be developed. The younger teachers can teach the older teachers how to use technology. Just tell us what the lesson is that you want to put together, and maybe the older teacher, the more senior teacher, can put the the brain power behind it, if you will, that this is a um, skill or a strategy that you're trying to accomplish. The, the, the young people might be able to do it with the technology, but they don't know what they're trying to connect. They, they're just doing things. They just do things and, oh, it works. Without rhyme or reason. It's in my mind, in my head, it makes sense. And I hope it's coming across to you. Yeah, I think for me, this particular article, I think what caught my attention was the fact that the, the original, I guess, the, the solution here is to award or congratulate a young boy for opting out. And I think that misses the whole point. Uh, there are many problems, as both of you are alluding to, that it's, it's a complex issue. And we as teachers, I think, um, have an obligation to ask the right questions to say, okay, if this boy is having so, you know, having problems uh, taking the test, and specifically, let's say he's having problems controlling his blood sugar, because that is the case for this particular uh, boy. Okay, what's the problem? Is it because of bullying? Okay, that's the problem. Let's address the problem of bullying. Let's the, address the problem of him learning how to control his blood sugar. Let's talk about those issues, and then also have at the same time another conversation about the role of testing and if testing is only a summative type of assessment that measures learning or if some way we can use testing to be more formative for for learning so you know a lot of issues a lot of com complexity here but um, I think for me personally again the reason why it kind of caught my attention was that we're, we're looking at the wrong thing I think we're focusing we've got our, our eye on on a different uh, target here that I think is not as productive as really looking at the issues, the underlying issues, uh, in this case, why this young, bo young man is having problems uh, passing a test. And he's certainly not the only one. This is prevalent throughout uh, the educational system. And so, uh, but certainly I think this is a worth uh, conversation to have and um, yeah, something that, that, that I wanted to, to put forward. So it uh, looks like we're getting close to, to being out of time. Uh, I would like to uh, thank all of you for, for participating in this session and uh, 
remind you of the links here. Uh, this is Teacher Talk Time. This will be a weekly program talking about educational topics, anything related to curriculum, assessment, and instruction, uh, perhaps technology. Uh, things that I come across, uh, I will be uploading to Digo. And let me go ahead and just grab that link real quick, and I'll put it in the chat box if I can find it. I have so many links here. Uh, let's see. Or maybe I didn't even include it, but it's it's here uh, in the slide presentation. But I'm sorry, I don't think you can access it here. I didn't uh, create a link, so I missed that. But it's a, a Deagle list um, where you, you can have access to the list of topics that will be discussed each week. And you're encouraged to make comments uh, add suggestions uh, to different topics to be discussed. Uh, the idea uh, of Teacher Talk Time, again, is to create an open forum, open discussion as we've done today, uh, and hearing uh, all of our opinions. Uh, it doesn't matter if we all agree. Uh, the point is that, uh, that we all share and feel open enough to share our own perspectives and ideas about education today based on what we're experiencing in our local context. So I appreciate uh, your your input uh, today and uh, hopefully we can uh, continue this conversation or on various different topics on a weekly basis through teacher talk time or through some other online asynchronous types of uh, communication through uh, blogs or, or what have you so again thank you very much for being here and um, I hope everyone has a great weekend and we'll see you next time we'll see you next week and bye for now thank you